What's up, guys, and welcome to One Take. I'm Gil, and I'm here with my friend Jeremy. Hello. And Jeremy's here. You know what that means. It means we're talking Star Wars, specifically The Mandalorian. Today, we're going to do a full recap and review of The Mandalorian Episode 6. Oh, sorry. I mean, Chapter 6. Uh, but before we do that, because we missed Episode 5, you know, life just gets in the way sometimes. Sometime, what's the name of that guy from uh, Jurassic Park? Jeff Goldblum? Yeah, you know, he, he always says life, life finds a way. Sometimes life doesn't find a way. So we missed episode five. But uh, this is the way, as they say. Anyway. <laughs> a lot of ways. Uh, but before we get into episode six, because we missed it, Jeremy, brief thoughts on episode five. Um. I enjoyed a lot of the moments of episode five. I thought the uh, exchange between Mando with the Tusken Raiders when he is uh, bargaining with with his buddies, uh, you know, binoculars was awesome. Right, he had to use the sign language, right? Yeah, I thought the stuff in the cantina was great. They go back. There's a droid bartender now. Droids used to not even be allowed in there. There's a lot of really cool stuff. I thought the the setting and, and background and uh, everything was awesome. I thought the the bounty hunter uh, character, or whatever, the, the guy that wanted to be in the guild, right. I, I thought he was maybe not the greatest actor I've ever seen. It was a little bit uh, over the top, but, you know, everything else I thought was, was really good and a little dramatic story beat there at the ending with the who is that person uh, right. going back to the body there. Overall, I liked it. I liked, I liked a lot of the moments, um, you know, it falls in line with everything else we've said where it's kind of like this show is very episodic each one is definitely kind of a standalone thing and that continues to be a little bit disappointing a little bit of an adjustment from what i was expecting but mm -hmm. we'll definitely get into that with episode six as well yeah it's chapter so six <laughs> a lot of the same thoughts for me. I was uh not the biggest fan of the village episode episode four right Episode five, I liked a little bit more than that one, but like you said, definitely adjusting my expectations. I, I could tell from the from episode two, they got us used to the idea that this is going to be somewhat episodic. I thought that it was going to be threading the needle where it was a little bit of both, but the last few episodes, it's been leaning very heavily into standalone stories, which just feels kind of old fashioned nowadays. It's not what I was looking for, so a bit disappointing. Uh, but we're still finding things, uh, like you said, there's still moments in here that we're enjoying. The show still looks incredible, sounds amazing. I'm, I'm always humming that. That's been like stuck right. in my head on loop for a while. So I've got good things to say about this show. I'm trying to be as positive as I can because once we get into episode six, it's a lot of stuff I didn't like. Right. There was also uh, Princess Carolyn from BoJack, and uh, and there were pit droids from Episode One. So that was that was fun. Yeah. You know. Sure. And there's some more references to Episode One in this episode. There are. Um, by the way, end of Episode Five, the mysterious figure that uh, approaches that uh, other. Well, I guess I don't know. How would you describe her? She was she a bounty hunter also. I. Th believe so right she was she was the subject of the bounty in episode five and she appears to have been killed and then a mysterious figure approaches her at the end of the episode right what's going on there yeah i mean i i think based on the way that his walk sounds i i think you're supposed to think that it maybe sounds like boba fett um i don't think it is boba fett but i think that you're I mean, he that sounds like what Boba Fett sounds like when he walks in, in when Empire. You, you so, mean like... Uh, yeah, I mean, it sounds like, like very Western-y. Like it sounds like he has like spurs on his okay. shoes, that kind of that kind of thing. Um, but I mean, I, I don't think it is him. I think I don't think, especially based on what we're seeing so far from this show, I don't think mm -hmm. there's going to be some big giant swerve like that. Other than I guess Baby Yoda was a pretty big swerve. So maybe, maybe I'm wrong, but yeah. Um, our, our theory was, uh, Giancarlo Esposito. Right. I always struggled. Am I saying his last name right? Esposito? Esposito. I think, I mean, I don't know. That's how I would say it. That's right. Yeah. Gustavo. There Gus. you go. Gus. Yeah. <laughs> Mainly because he's a big actor and we haven't seen him yet. Mm -hmm. So we're thinking maybe that is the mysterious yeah, figure. Yeah. That, 
sounds right to me. Now, in hindsight, it is so weird that we saw so many of these big name actors in this trailer, and they are all in one episode, basically. Yeah, I mean, we had I, I assumed that uh, uh, Werner Herzog was going to be like the villain character, right? And maybe he's pulling some I mean, of the he, strings behind. He the has scenes. to come back, right? At least there's too much established with him in the first one. Yeah, and they didn't close out his storyline. He just disappeared. And you've got to think he still wants to get his clutches on Baby Yoda. Right. For what purpose, we don't know. Right. But I got to assume he's going to... My, my feeling is this show is probably going to be... Uh, like, I, the, the template for episodic television, television seems to be your premiere episode furthers the storyline, creates some kind of cliffhanger. Then you have a bunch of standalone stories, and the finale is where you get another progression of the plot. Right. So I'm assuming maybe Werner Herzog shows back up in episode eight. Yeah, that could. I, I mean, I feel like he has to for the season to have any kind of a arc to it at all, be other other than just kicking a snowball uh, called Baby Yoda down a hill and having it just pick up this momentum. You know, I don't know. <laughs> right. Exactly. Okay. Well, with that, let's jump in to episode six, and uh, I guess I'll be taking the reins this week on the recap. And then we'll pass it back over to you. The I was going to try and make a joke about in a, a, a blurg, like taking the reins of a horse. Oh, taking the reins blurg. of a blurg. Yeah. Yeah, but uh, I'll work on that. Been through the desert on a blurg with no name. Yeah. <laughs> so first off, the episode begins with a recap of previous episodes, which I find funny just because it's like a previously on, but you don't really have to know any of the stuff it reminds right. you of. Like it shows you scenes from last week where they, where they kill that other bounty hunter it's like that knowledge wasn't really that important for going into this episode. Wasn't at all. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so there's that. And then uh, I think I mentioned in episode one that it's really hard to take seriously all their use of sci-fi words because of Rick and Morty. Right. And then this episode, like two weeks ago, there was a Rick and Morty episode that spoofs the the, the prison heist right. trope. So, so Putting a team together. Yeah. <laughs> you son of a bitch. I'm, I'm in. in. <laughs> so Rick and Morty really doing a number on this show. Yeah, I mean, it's the exact thing. They go through the people one by one. And, oh, this is Mayfield. He's the best sharpshooter in the, you know, it's 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 exactly that. Right, exactly. Um, but episode starts off with Mando landing in the spaceport where he meets Ranzar Malk. Ran for short. And we recognize this guy. You've probably seen him in Batman Begins. Memento. Um, those are the two I was those thinking are the of. Two big ones, yeah. Big Christopher uh, Nolan guy, I guess. He has a, a great line in Batman Begins that my brother Alun, who you've heard on this podcast a couple times, we quote him all the time. So in Batman Begins, he's this crooked cop, and he goes to a falafel stand and just steals food from the stand. And the guy running it goes, "Hey man, I got kids at home." And then this guy goes, "What? They don't like falafel?" <laughs> <laughs> I completely forgot that. Yeah. That's a great line. So Mando is there for a job, apparently. Because he walks in, he goes, What's the job? <laughs> and <laughs> and uh, it's a prison break. They need it. They need Mando's help. Specifically, they need his ship. Something about how all of their ships have been, uh, I don't know, would be spotted by Imperial. Some, they need Mando's ship because it's the sort ship. of anonymous. They that need was my the take on it. And you can tell that Ran and Mando have some history. Mando says, uh, or Ran says, we did some crazy stuff back then, <laughs> didn't we? <laughs> and Mando says, that was a long time ago. One last job. Very, very that kind of a feel. Right, exactly. And uh, then we meet the team. That's going to be... Uh, so the, the basic premise of this job is they're going to break into a transport ship, which is a prison transport ship run by the New Republic. Which Mando doesn't know yet. Right. They just tell him it's a transport ship. And in the process of explaining the plan, he uh, basically says, wait a minute, this is a prison ship. This is not what I signed up for. I, don't, I can't take that kind of heat right now. No questions. <laughs> That's <What's>, the job. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> that's the man. That's the Mandalorian way. Uh, but there's uh, so we meet the crew. You've got Bill Burr playing Mayfeld. Uh, you've got this guy Berg, 
this big guy with uh, horns, and uh, they say, this may surprise you, but he's our muscle, which I, I guess that was a joke because it wouldn't surprise you. Right. Big, giant, Devorian, as it were. And is that a species we're familiar with? Uh, we've He's not the first one we've seen, for sure, mm-hmm. um, but this is the most interaction we've had with one, at least in a live action sense. I can't speak that well to, to the animated, the series. animated stuff, uh, but in terms of this is the most dialogue we've heard out of one. Right. And this Berg was also the uh, voice actor for... Mr. Krabs. That's right. A lot of voice actors appearing on the show. Princess Caroline actors. from uh, Bojack. Bojack, last episode. Yeah, so so the crew is Bill Burr, Mayfeld, Berg, Zero, Droid, and uh, another Twi'lek named uh, Chien, who's basically, uh, I would describe her as like Catwoman, basically. Yeah, I get yeah, like a caricature of Catwoman, like the most cartoony Catwoman possible, including the hissing and stuff, which I don't, <laughs> which was interesting. I don't know. Yeah, and at times vaguely, I don't. It's some it seems like she's trying to have like innuendo. It sometimes. reminded me of the exchange that he has with the bartender woman in um in the village episode chapter four, I guess mm-hmm. that was where I was like, wait, is this like her? character is the acting just not matching the tone of some of the other acting um she's just very over the top whole whole episode like it was like is is the is the character within the series acting or is just the person playing the thing not you know right it's just weird because like mandalorian is so gritty and and she in a way that's not as corny or is corny but in a like a different flavor of corny right. than her with the hissing and the teeth and the tongue and the, you know, oh, would you just shut up or, or whatever she <laughs> says later on. You know? Yeah, Mando, it's different flavors of corn. Mando is like classic corn on the cob. <laughs> and then uh, she's like creamed corn. Creamed corn, yeah. yeah like nobody wants creamed corn. I mean, I've, I've <laughs> made things with creamed corn. I've made like a, uh, you know, like a corn pudding that has creamed corn in it. Okay. It's very good. There's ways that it can combine with other corns to... <laughs> So I th- it's just a, we just need to adjust our expectations. We were looking for one kind of corn, yes. and we're getting another, which I think works as the series as a whole. Yeah, yeah. And uh, okay, we were giving the series a couple knocks, but there was a pretty cool moment here—a nice reference where uh, Ran introduces Bill Burr's character as a former Imperial sharpshooter, and Mando says, "That's not saying much." And he goes, "I wasn't a stormtrooper." So the series poking fun at stormtroopers not having sure. the best aim. And everybody on the team seems to hate uh, the Mandalorian here. They kind of like giving him the stink eye. Right. Uh, you can tell they have some, uh, he has some history, at least with Chien, the Twi'lek. Uh, but anyway, so Zero, the droid, goes onto the ship and he sees a portion of Grief Karga's message to Mando. He can't really piece together what he's talking about yet. But eventually in the episode, he'll see the full transmission and realize that there's a valuable Baby Yoda aboard. <laughs> <laughs> He's got a Baby Yoda on here. <laughs> uh, so the plan is, yeah, this is where we find out that the transport ship is a prison ship. The plan is to go aboard and free someone. We'll find out who that is later. They sneak onto the transport ship uh, or they're on Mando's ship flying to the transport ship. While they're on there, Berg, the big red guy with horns, starts opening up compartments, snooping around, looking at Mando's guns. Mando gets annoyed, it shuts the door almost on his hand. And then Mayfeld, Bill Burr, breaks up the fight and he defends Mando. He says, I get it. We're all particular about our private space. Uh, But then they start kind of turning on Mando and making fun of him. Bill says, apparently Mandalorians are the greatest warriors in the galaxy. And then Burk has a great line where he says, why are they all dead? And then all the actors pretend to laugh. (laughs) (laughs) I mean, it's a fair point, kind of, except, I mean, they're not all dead as we know from having seen other ones, but yeah. It's a good enough point. They were wiped out by Jedi, though, right? I believe so, yeah. Yeah, so it's kind of like purge. If, if the Jedi set their sights uh, on anybody, I mean, they're going to be in trouble. Right. And that purge, I believe, is part of what made Mandalorians into such great warriors. 
So, you know, we all have growing pains, and I think this Berg fellow needs to cut Mando some slack. I agree. Uh, and then Bill Bill Burr, uh, what's what's his character? Mayfeld. Mayfeld. It's confusing because uh, Bill Burr and Berg, and they're not the same character. Yeah, exactly. It sounds like a similar, and Blurg is a different thing, and there's a lot of, you know. There's too many, but, and then Bill Burr is basically playing himself, it feels like. Yes. Um, but he says uh, he tries to get Mando to take his helmet off, and he's like, "Why won't you, Why won't you take your helmet off? Maybe he's a Gungan of uh, under there." And he says, "Bill Burr uh, with all the inside <laughs> Star Wars jokes." Is that why you uh, don't want to show your face? Yeah. So uh, for people who don't know what Gungans are, I mean, Jar Jar Binks, the most famous Gungan from uh, from Episode One. There's also you know Boss Nass and Captain Tarples and all these other uh, people, but Jar Jar obviously gets a lot of flack for being a over the top cartoony character that didn't seem to match the tone of maybe but maybe the star wars tone is just a mismatched tone yeah <laughs> <laughs> because it's basically a theme in every movie you can say like ah, it doesn't feel like star wars so maybe that's just what star wars is yeah maybe it's like a a you know i don't know a, a sandwich that has some weird uh what's something you wouldn't put on a sandwich and like a lunch meat sandwich with if like it was like a like ice cream or something yeah you're like this is for kids. This doesn't. I don't want this in my adult sandwich. A scoop of ice cream. But then you get past the ice cream, and there's like a piece of bacon on there. No, no. Oh, well, okay. I like this though. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I like totally lost track of what we're talking about now. I was like, yeah, I can go for a yeah, sandwich. Yeah, bacon right now. sandwich. Oh, we were on Bill Burr and the Gungan uh, reference from him. That's there's right. That's Gungan right. Gungan under there. And I, I thought it was funny when he said, "You said don't want to show your face." He said it with as little accent as possible. I think to avoid. Some of the uh, some of the controversy around that character back oh, in the day, sure, yeah, that it might have been sort of a racial uh, cliche, yeah. So here he played it very straight. Yusa, don't want to show your face. This is pretty funny. I would love if there was a Jar Jar Binks uh, cameo on this show. <laughs> there was actually in the uh, in the extended lore of Star Wars, in one of the books, they revealed the fate of Jar Jar Binks, and apparently he's disgraced. He's like a street performer now, and everyone makes fun of him and hates him. Mm. Well, he is the one that proposes that uh, Palpatine get, you know, imperial power. That's technically, he he sets that in motion. And that's part of why there's the theories around... Right, he is the... Uh, he's the mastermind he's behind everything. Sith Lord, and Snoke is Jar Jar, and whatever. <laughs> whatever else stuff you want to... Great, well, well, fun watch. Fun YouTube rabbit hole to go down. We'll find out for sure in about four days when that's Rise true. of Skywalker comes out. We'll find out that Jar Jar Binks is a Skywalker, and he is the one who is rising this Thursday night. <laughs> Maybe. <laughs> Maybe. Anyway, in in all of this action, uh, Mando and the Berg start fighting, and Baby Yoda's revealed. Mando tries to cover it up, claiming it's a pet. Bill Burr picks up Baby Yoda, pretends to drop it, and then actually drops. Actually drops it. It's Baby a violent Yoda. drop. He like hits the ground and kind of does like a little barrel roll almost in the in the commotion. Yeah, uh, which we can blame on Zero for not even giving them a proper countdown, as one of the uh, criminal people say. I forget who says. I believe it, it was Chien. Yes, yes, uh, I think that's right. Yeah, yeah. Big commotion. A lot of maybe the most drama in the in the episode is when he's because Baby Yoda has actual stakes attached to him, as opposed to all the other people in this episode who are right. what's the Star Trek? Uh, <laughs> oh, the red shirts. Yeah, like one of the everyone else in this episode is that. Yeah, yeah. Or you didn't find uh, that you became emotionally invested in Berg? Or Ch- uh, or I did not. I did not. <laughs> not Berg, no. <laughs> <laughs> so they land on the transporter ship very roughly, as Jeremy said. And once they're on there, Bill Burr tells everyone, we got to be careful. The second we engage with these droids, they're going to be all over us. And then they proceed to walk very casually through the ship. Uh, talking pretty loudly, I thought. And then Berg sees a little robot and shoots it. Mouse and, droid. And as promised, the droids are all over them. So I think they've, they've basically gotten together the worst possible team for, uh, 
for any kind of a heist that involves needing to be sneaky. Right. Big, giant, muscly guy. Um, you know, someone that hisses a lot yeah. and makes side comments. Yeah, it's not a good... And a stand-up comedian. Jobs to talk for a living. <laughs> uh, so the droids show up. And this is where I'll say... This is probably the best scene of the episode. Because Mando basically goes John Wick on these droids. He makes full use of his flamethrower, his yeah. grappling hook. And I've complained before about whenever this show does close quarters action, it doesn't look good. Here, it looked awesome. It did. Uh, and then afterwards, though, I mean, everyone stands back and lets Mando do all the work. They give him crap after. Right. I, I thought it was uh, my younger brother I was watching this with. He compared it to Shaun of the Dead. There's a great scene where Sean is basically left to his own devices to fight these uh, zombies. And then afterwards, he turns to the rest of them and he's like, feel free to step in any time. <laughs> but Mando's not the quipping type, generally. So he just takes crap for it and moves on. Yeah, it was like it was like they were seeing if he could do it. You know, it was, can he live up to the Mandalorians are supposed to be the toughest warriors? Like, well, let's see if he's got it. Like a... Nobody makes their first jump, kind of a moment, right? Uh, but yeah, no, it, it was awesome. It was a it was a great fight scene. Yeah, no, it was awesome. Blows the and... hole through the droid, and then you get the classic like see through the droid's head. Oh yeah, shot at the end of it. It was cool. Yeah, it was awesome, and uh, it didn't. It easily could have suffered from fighting, basically fighting a bunch of CGI droids. It might end up looking kind of weightless or not real, but everything in this episode looked incredible. It's probably the best thing I could say about this episode is it looked great, and the score throughout this episode was just awesome. The score was very awesome. They get to a room and find a uh, a guy who works on the ship, a New Republic. He's wearing one of the classic big Star Wars hats. Yep. It looks kind of like a <laughs> mullet helmet. <laughs> big hat. It's funny. Uh, and then Bill Burr uh, says, nice shoes, matches his belt. <laughs> Didn't really get that. Yeah, I, I don't know. He's just trying to demean him and accidentally complimented him. <laughs> yeah, I guess. I'm going to try and use that. Next time I walk into a meeting, I'm not feeling very confident. Right. I'm going to try and throw the guy off by uh, being like, nice shoes, matches your belt. Yeah, I will say, if someone said that to me, I would immediately become insecure. Like whenever someone at work says like, "Hey, nice haircut," I'm like, "Ah, great, my hair's messed up." Like that's what it, I, I do think that right away. So maybe he assumed that this uh, guy was also an insecure type. This guy who uh, voices Anakin in the Clone Wars cartoon series. Oh, that's right. Way. That's right. Easter egg. Easter egg. Yeah. <laughs> Easter suga. Nice. <laughs> uh, so. They end up in basically uh, a Mexican, what's it called? Standoff? Mexican standoff, yeah. <laughs> I was like, when do they go to a Mexican restaurant? <laughs> and the guy, the, the New Republic guy, pulls out a little beacon, which he activates. And then Bill Burr explains that he activated basically an emergency distress signal. And he says that when those ships arrive, based off that beacon, right. we're finished. They're well, I think he doesn't activate up. it. I think they don't realize it's activated. You're right, you're right. Yeah, he pulls it out. He says, if he activates it, we're right. done. Right. Ships are going to show up, blow us all to hell. <laughs> Chian, <laughs> it's like, you left out that detail. And Burr says, I didn't think we'd get to this point. But I mean, he left out that detail. Did you really need the concept of reinforcements explained to you? Like, you didn't assume that if we get caught, they're going to call for help and they're going to kill right. us probably. I mean, Mando definitely assumed that because he says they're like, I can't afford that kind of heat right now. You know, he like so she must have been very confused in that scene. Heat. What's he talking about? Right. Yeah. It was a tr yeah. It was a warm planet that the she probably <laughs> thought that. <laughs> right. She's like uh, Doc Brown. Every time he's like, why do you keep saying it, this is heavy? Is there a problem with the gravitational pull? Like, why do you keep referring to temperature? I don't understand. Uh, Mando doesn't want them to kill the guy. So I think my theory of why he's so careful he doesn't want to kill him, uh, I was going to say he's only okay with killing helmeted people. He's killed a bunch of stormtroopers. Mm. But I guess, no, I mean, the guy, he's a good guy. He doesn't want to kill good guys. He's okay with killing gangsters and stormtroopers. And Jawas. And Jawas. Yeah, Jawas he doesn't give a crap about. Yeah. But uh, Jawas don't seem to care about Jawas either, as we've 
discussed. <laughs> as we've established. Uh, but before they can, uh, as the Mexican standoff is really heating up, uh, Chian throws a little knife, a little blade at the guy and kills him. Kills him. But not before he can activate the distress beacon. It was all for nothing. He didn't have to die. He hit the button anyway. Yep. Poor, uh, poor Anakin. Poor Anakin. Uh, so the distress signal has been set off. The lights on the ship are blinking, so you know something bad's going down. They uh, leave the room, and there's these two big droids. Berg picks up one of them, throws it at the other, takes him out. And unlike Mando, when he does something badass, Berg actually gets props for this. Mm. Bill Berg gives him an approving nod. He, like, cracks his neck as, like, a, you know... Uh, just getting warmed up like that kind of yeah, a thing. Yeah, do your worst. <laughs> <laughs> and then they find the guy they're there to free, and it's another Twi'lek named Quinn. And then uh, Quinn jumps out of his prison cell they freed him from, and what does he say? Sister. Brother. And then she says brother. Yeah. Thus telling us that they are brother and sister. And that's the kind of deep dive content you only get... <laughs> On this podcast. Yeah, Jeremy, what do you think he meant when he said brother and sister? It's interesting, and I did think about it. I assume they have some sort of a biological relationship. Which connects into, I mean, Star Wars, it's like Ray's parents. They, they care a lot about lineage and family. Right. Legacy. Exactly. That's Watchmen. <laughs> uh, and then they throw Mando into the cell. And very cool moment here where uh, a laser blaster gets fired and the laser bounces around in the yeah. room. It's pretty cool. Hits him in the best car. That's good right. He's got that best car. Yeah, it's a good thing he's got that best car steal because it's coming. It comes in handy a few times this episode. Yeah. They leave him in the cell, but then uh, as a droid's walking by, Mando uses his grappling hook to pull the droid in. He rips the droid's arm off. And then uses that to escape. That was impressive. I didn't like. Is it just that easy, or do you think he had like computer knowledge to be able to do that? Like, if I had a droid arm, could I get myself out of that prison cell? Is it the same as just scanning a fingerprint? The classic, like, cut the guy. I, arm I think off it's and... a step or two above that mm. because you have to know that the droids. I bet you it's a fairly well known thing that the droids on that ship have a key like built into their finger to right. unlock the doors. So I bet Mando had to have that pre-existing knowledge. And also, it's probably not typical that you would be locked in a cell with all your tools and your weapons. That's true. So he happened to have his grappling hook on him and he was uh, because the team, they didn't really have time to like strip him of his armor before throwing him in there. Yeah. So lucky for him. So Mando gets out. I will say, though, I do feel that the droids on this ship are all acting pretty casual uh, in spite of the fact that a distress signal was set off, clearly an escape is happening, right? And bad stuff is going down. Yet this one droid is just casually He's still on his patrol, just normal patrol, yeah. normal. So he wasn't alerted when uh, Berg shoots the mouse droid. The same way that the three droids that come in after that obviously were alerted, right? He, he wasn't was alerted when Berg killed the mouse droid, or when Mando killed like seventeen more droids, right? Or when the New Republic guard was killed and set off a distress signal. Yep, Berg kills the other two droids after that. Kills, destroys, I guess. I don't know. Yeah. Terminates. Terminates. Anyway, still pretty cool escape sequence. And then we get into a pretty cool part of the episode where Mando goes to the control room, puts basically puts the ship in emergency mode. All the lights turn red. <laughs> <laughs> what? I I yeah, <laughs> it's a photo development ship. That's what they, That's why they have that setting. He also cuts off communication, so Berg and the rest of the crew can't talk to Zero, the droid who's still aboard the ship. Yeah, they went from communicating with Zero to Zero communicating. Oh! Good night. <laughs> we should just end this here. <laughs> uh, and then uh, Mando also starts shutting doors, so he's separating the crew. It kind of breaks him apart. And uh, Quinn... As he's uh, walking along, sees a bunch of dead droids and says, <laughs> Mando always did hate droids. <laughs> so I don't know, Jeremy, you think this is an important point uh, that Mando, I don't know, apparently doesn't like droids very much. They have gone out of their way to hit us over the head with that he doesn't like droids. And uh, we haven't really had 
to, I mean, we got a little bit more payoff in whatever. What? When did we get the last flashback? To uh, the, episode three, because that's when he returns to the uh, Mandalorian headquarters. Right, right, right. And we get slightly more extended view of the flashback where the droid points the points his arm at him and is about to shoot him and then something happened you know we don't know what happens after that right. presumably the droid gets shot in the back of the head by somebody else because <laughs> that's the calling card of this show yeah that's the show's uh <laughs> trick which we'll get to but anytime they're when they're in the writer's room like this episode i don't know it needs something it's missing a little something <laughs> what about a sequence where it looks like someone's about to get shot we hear the gun go off but then that person wasn't shot the person who was about to shoot was shot. <laughs> this man is a genius. <laughs> <laughs> and then they fall to the side and we reveal who really shot them. Uh, so Mandalorian basically one by one systematically takes out each of the other people in the crew. Berg walks into a room and unbeknownst to him, Mando is above him in uh, kind of in the vent. Yeah. Shoots his grappling hook out around Berg's neck. But that's not enough to stop a no. Berg. Berg pulls him through the, a Devorian. Berg is oh, his right. name. Yes. Yeah. Don't be a species. Yes. Or no, I guess you're being a namist. I, I was, see, I was yeah, calling you, him by his name. You're the one who's trying to reduce him to just one member of some species. Right, right. But what a species they are. Yeah. <laughs> Does fire affect them? No. <laughs> Does not. Not only that, so they struggle a bit, and Mando manages to close a door on him. Yeah. But that's not enough. The Berg pushes the door back up. Right. And then Mando closes another door on him, but maybe not. Maybe just in front of him. Maybe. Yeah, that was unclear. Well, we know, you know, from episode, uh, from the first, from chapter one, he's not afraid to kill people by closing doors on them. That's right. m maybe is the first thing we see him do, basically. Yeah, that's true. His introduction to the show was slicing someone in half with a with door. A door. So he knows how to use a door as a weapon. And uh, <laughs> uh, then he approaches a Twi'lek. She starts throwing darts at him. And what I thought of in this scene was Dark Knight Rises, mm. where he's taught where Batman's talking to uh, Lucius Fox. Yeah. And uh, Fox, or this was in Dark Knight, actually. And Fox tells him that the suit should do well against cats. Uh, and, and then I think in episode in the third in Dark Knight Rises basically says that he's got to be careful around blades because they could always sneak in between right. the armor parts right. of his suit. So right here, Twi'leks throwing darts at him or blades. They're bouncing off of steel, but one of them hits him. It's not enough to stop him. They get into some hand-to-hand -hand combat and Mando gets the better of her, holds a knife to her throat. I thought there was going to be something of like where she has intimate knowledge of the where the spaces are in his armor and she can get sneak a knife in there, you know, because they had right. some kind of intimate history and she knows, I don't know, some openings or something. She knows her way around best car steel. Like she yeah. knows uh, they've never figured out how to properly shape best car around you know, the hip or something. Yeah. So yeah. that's where you can attack them. Right. But, Which uh, I guess maybe she did. I don't know. She did sneak the one in there. But. Yeah. But wasn't enough to stop him. And then uh, maybe the coolest part of the episode, if you want to break down the Mayfeld attack. Uh, yeah. I mean, it was it's kind of a, a cla like a, a horror movie trope where we see Mayfeld with all the lights flickering behind him. There's like a, a strobe light going on in the distance. A very uh, Half-Life 1 style mm, with the flickering yeah. light. And then you see the Mandalorian get closer and closer it kind of alternates between getting close to him and then you can't see him at all getting close he gets even closer you can't see him at all bill burr mayfeld turns around and then mando is right behind him right and Great. bill burr shouts no yeah <laughs> very cool uh very cool sequence maybe my probably the, the most obvious cool sequence in the in the episode i guess i know when it, mandalorian first fights the droids that was awesome too but this is probably the other the signature moment, I would say. Yeah, this is the one people are talking about. Yeah. Because the other one was cool, but it was just, wow, that was cool action. Yeah. This is doing something interesting, or a horror movie, almost like Xenomorph from Alien Vibes. Right, yes. Uh, also v extremely similar to a scene in Scary Stories to Tell in the Dark. Did you see that I have movie? not seen it. Not a big scary movie person. Okay, well, there's a, there's a sequence where flashing red lights 
and a monster is approaching a character, every time the character turns, the monster is closer. Mm. So very similar. Uh, but uh, also just a similar sequence we've seen in many things. So I'm not saying they stole it from that movie. Right, right, right. That was a... Uh, who was that? Was that Gabriel... Uh... Who did that movie? The director. I know um, Guillermo del Toro produced Guillermo it. Del Toro. He didn't direct it. Though. Right, right, right. Oh, classic swerve. Like I how, know. Uh, uh, what's the Jet Li movie? Hero. That, I know yeah, exactly yeah, what you're talking yeah. about. I was like, oh, Quentin Tarantino. Awesome. No, had yeah, nothing Presented to by Quentin right, Tarantino. Right. One is a fine, Hero is a, is a, uh, is a, you know, a fine movie, but it was just not what I, similar to Mandalorian, not quite what I was expecting. Right, right. Then Mando finds the last remaining person, and that's Quinn. And uh, Quinn's like, you killed the others. And Mando says, they got what they deserved. And Mando's holding his gun to Quinn. Quinn basically says, look, turn me in, finish the job, get your money. Right. You're a man of honor. Isn't that your code? Mando lowers his gun, takes him in. And uh, then meanwhile, though, Back on the ship. That's right. Zero, the droid, is on the ship. He sees the rest of Grief Karga's message, realizes it's Baby Yoda character. It's worth something. So he starts looking for Baby Yoda. And we were actually cutting back to the ship sequence throughout the episode. Right. Basically a game of cat and mouse where droid is looking for Baby Yoda, can't find him. Eventually he does find him. He's poking his head around the corner. Very cute. Very Baby cute. Baby Yoda. Yeah. And then uh, knows he's in danger. Knows he's in a bad spot. Yeah, he definitely sh- he shows a level of of uh, understanding of the situation. Mm-hmm. That definitely he's he, he's more than a baby, perhaps even more than a toddler. <laughs> <laughs> perhaps. So what happens here, Jeremy, when Zero finds Baby Yoda? For some reason, you assume that he read the he gets the message, so he understands Baby Yoda, very valuable commodity. He appears to still want to kill him, which doesn't seem necessary. Mm-hmm. But I don't know. He's a droid; he knows more than I do. Uh, he finds him. He points the big blaster rifle at him. Baby Yoda raises his hand, very similar to when he lifts the uh, giant creature from episode uh, tra- chapter two. Uh, and then as he's about to fire, Yoda seems to twist his hand. Uh, Zero has been eliminated. Baby Yoda looks at his hand kind of in a, like, my God, what have I done? Did I do that? Type Right. <laughs> type moment, like, in this awareness of his powers. And then you're not going to believe it. Zero <laughs> falls over. Mandalorian was behind him. He shot him. Baby Yoda didn't do anything. Um but what a moment. Or maybe he did. Maybe maybe Zero actually had already pulled the trigger, but Baby Yoda stopped the blaster bolt with his Could be. force, you know, powers. Um but classic Mandalorian again. Yeah. <laughs> that bullet didn't come from who you the blaster bolt didn't come from who you think it did. Yeah. Um it is a cool Baby Yoda moment though where he's like a oh my gosh, do I have this power? Right. To kill. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the taste of blood. <laughs> That felt good. (laughs) (laughs) Now that would be... (laughs) As soon as he, uh, his first words, it turns to Mando. He's like, Mandalorian, I have a question. Why does someone have to die for me to feel good? (laughs) Uh, Yeah, so then, so Mandalorian eliminates his zero. He seems to have a thing for uh, killing droids. Yeah, He, he does not like droids. Doesn't, doesn't like them. And this is not going to help the cause. Right. This is the second time a droid's tried to kill Baby Yoda. Uh, what if this show does go like Akira style, where uh, Baby Yoda does end up realizing his power and yeah. becoming evil? Yeah. And then it becomes, we got to put down Baby Yoda. That would be cool. Season two? Oh. <laughs> the hunt for Baby Yoda? Yeah. Yeah, as opposed to protecting him, now you're going after him. Kind of like a ter- inverted Terminator twist yeah going from two to one uh and then uh and then like at the end of season two when mando approaches baby yoda mando's like you were like a brother to me (laughs) i have the high ground (laughs) which was also referenced we didn't say that in our uh episode five tiny episode five recap they make a higher ground reference when they first start because she has the she has the higher ground yeah 
Yeah. Mandalorian had some good lines in that episode too. He did. I mean, Mandalorian has been. I think the thing I've loved about Mandalorian, or the thing that makes it so enjoyable, is you're watching a competent character. Yeah. Be a badass. Yeah. Doesn't talk when he doesn't need to. And in the first three episodes. I think the focus was so much on him yeah. that that was pretty much all you were getting, and it was great. In these next few episodes, they've tried to introduce other characters, and it's kind of diluting the awesomeness of Mando. Mm-hmm. But, uh, but I mean, when he's still great, though. I still love the character. Yeah, the character's great. So, yeah, Baby Yoda looks at his hand. Very cute moment. And then uh, they get back to Ran, the... Uh, yeah, they don't like falafel, guy that sent them on this mission. <laughs> when Mando returns, Rand says, where are the others? Or more like, where are the others, Mando? And Mando says, no questions asked. That's the policy, right? And, uh, yeah, that's Hoisted that. Hoisted by his own petard. Oh, that's right. <laughs> uh, then Mando leaves, but they're not done. Because Rand turns to Chien and says, kill him. So they want to kill Mando, but they don't know. They, they don't know that Mando has planted the uh, distress signal device on their ship, which means that X-Wings are on their way. They show up. One of them flown by David. The, uh, Filoni? David Filoni, that's right. <laughs> Dave to, to his closest friends. Yeah, <laughs> as Jeremy calls him. So a nice cameo there. DF. <laughs> And Deep Karga. <laughs> so the X-Wings, uh, they blow up. They start shooting at the ship and presumably kill Ran and Quinn. Uh, and then Mando, uh, as they fly off, turns to Baby Yoda and says... <laughs> I told you that was a bad idea. <laughs> so are we to interpret from that that Baby Yoda was a big proponent of this plan? It was like, it was like, come on, we should land on the, you know, Rand's a good friend of yours. He needs help. We should go help him out. And he's like, I don't know. I don't think it's a good idea. Baby Yoda talks a lot. We just don't see it on camera. <laughs> Baby Yoda talks when Mando's taking his helmet off, mm. you know, off screen. Oh, yeah. Um, yeah. He can only talk to the, when he sees like a human face or, you know, when he sees a face. Perhaps a Gungan face. Perhaps a Gungan yet. face. Yep. Uh, I thought, oh, yeah. And then episode's not done yet. Uh, don't worry, Mando is not as cold-blooded as we thought because we see that Bill Burr, uh, Chien, and Berg are in prison uh, on the prison ship. Right. Berg, the biggest twist there because he, and we just rewatched this again right before we started. I mean, it looks like he is crushed to death by the doors. Absolutely. Yeah, that door, I've never seen a door close viciously. Yeah. That door closed yes. viciously. There was no... That's not an elevator you'd want to get on if it had doors no. closed like that. Now, to be fair, you do see Berg uh, kind of rubbing his forehead and going like, Ugh, right, Ugh. close call with that door, whoo, <laughs> that kind of thing. I, I found it strange that Mando. I mean, I wasn't surprised to find they were still alive because this show, when someone is killed, has not shied away from showing them killed. Mando kept giving vague answers like, "You killed them." I did what I had to. Right. It doesn't say yes, but it's it's kind of odd that he made the choice not to kill them, mm-hmm. uh, especially considering he does make the choice to kill Quinn and Ran at the end there. Um, but I guess that's because he knew they were going to try to kill him. I don't know how he knew that, but I don't know. I found that kind of yeah. odd. Well, especially because they all know about Baby Yoda also. They all were there when Baby Yoda was there. Right. To me, that would be enough to... You know, they had they knew Baby Yoda was some kind of valuable commodity that they were joking about taking right. and stuff. I think that would be enough. Yeah, I guess. Okay, if I was gonna if I'm gonna have charitable read on this, yes, they know Baby Yoda is there. Bill Burr and, and Berg and Chien, they don't know that Baby Yoda is valuable. Just zero because did. Zero found that out uh, on the ship, right? And he tries to tell Mayfeld, Bill Burr, but he, and the word but doesn't Bill get Burr out. Says like, yeah, 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 whatever, whatever. Yeah. And then I was trying to think if somehow Quinn and Rand could know that, so he needed to kill them, but I don't think they would have... I don't think they had that knowledge. I don't think Zero maybe got the Maybe he knew he, they were going to try to kill him? It's got to be, I guess. Maybe, maybe he just, he's he morally this, gray. Morally gray? Yeah. 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 
All right. I guess so. Mandalorian. All right. So that's the end of episode six. Uh, obviously, I was not a fan of this episode. Mm-hmm. Like, I, I'll say when we, when Jeremy first got here, I said that may have been the worst episode of television I've ever seen. It seems like an aggressive take. And then you said that, and yeah, you're right. It was definitely not the worst episode I've seen. Um, it's, I was trying to think of a worse one, but <laughs> <laughs> episode four. Just kidding. Uh, <laughs> I, I mean, I think the thing is that. If if you if you start to look at them, it's disappointing when you know how much it cost and the uh, probably approvals that it had to go through to get this kind of thing made. But I think the best way to try to look at them is just standalone episodes that are more about learning about the or becoming acquainted with the Mandalorian mm-hmm. as a as a character. And I think they kind of set up expectations that there's going to be a lot of big reveals based on the first episode with you get all this who's the client who is he working with what do they want to do with this guy oh my gosh baby yoda and then every episode after that doesn't really have anything that crazy pushes the story you get a little bit more details about the mandalorian's background you get whoever the mysterious figure is at the end of episode five chapter five uh but there's not really any overarching thing which is very counter to as you mentioned before basically every other modern tv show that uh, you know, somebody would do a podcast about. It's not like right. You know, there, there was isn't. A, um, there probably is, but a, a King of Queens podcast or something <laughs> where you're breaking down. You're not gonna believe. You're not gonna believe what happened this week. The trouble Doug's gotten himself into. <laughs> right. That all manages to reset itself by the end of the episode, and we start where we ended with Mandalorian and Baby Yoda on a, you know, on the ship. Right. Right. And uh, yeah, and, and I. I wouldn't. I don't think I would mind a show where every episode or most episodes are standalone, uh, if they were done better. Mm. I mean, it feels to me like every character on the show, besides Mando, is just the acting is rough. Like it's so over the top, and yeah, and it's just disappointing because the show looks so good mm, and sounds good it sounds great and uh, i thought it started really strong i love the first few episodes um so i mean i i do think that it's just going to be one of those shows where you like some episodes and you don't like some um but i'm i've got high expectations for the next couple because the next episode which psa is coming out this wednesday not friday uh that episode is directed by deborah chow who did episode three, I believe, which I was a big fan of. Yep. And then the finale, uh, December 27th, is directed by Taika Waititi. So I think that the next two are going to be... It's funny to say this about a show that's only been on for a few weeks. It'll be a return to form Mm. for Mandalorian. Fans of the first three episodes rejoice. Yeah. (laughs) <laughs> was that a joke about like the f- like uh, first three episodes of Star Wars, like the prequels, or I don't know. It just no? felt like a fun phrase. Yeah, yeah. I don't know. I've, I mean, I still, I still like it. I just my expectations of it have changed a lot. Like, there's not going to be any kind of crazy high drama. It's just going right. to be some classic misadventures in set in the Star Wars world. Yep, and. Uh, I think you said this the last time we spoke. We will certainly have another example of a character pointing a gun at oh. Baby Yoda. And you think they shoot, but they don't. Somebody else shot, taking out the uh, perpetrator. Yeah, yeah. And at, at this point, they've done it so many times, I don't want them to stop. Yeah, it's it's a thing. It's a signature, you know, uh, the Joker laughs. Um, I, I don't know. I, Batman... Uh, disappears when you turn your back on him for a second the mandalorian makes it look like someone else shot but then he shoots yeah exactly and we've accepted that that is part of the show that's canon exactly more like blaster (laughs) (laughs) well thanks for listening to this week's episode of the one take podcast And if you enjoyed this episode, make sure to go into iTunes, leave a rating, leave a review, and tell your friends. Also, if you're a fan of Watchmen, we will be doing a deep dive into the Watchmen finale, which airs tonight. 
You can look out for that episode probably Monday or Tuesday. And I'll definitely be bringing Jeremy back to talk about Star Wars because we're going to be seeing Rise of Skywalker opening night. And uh, I was on the fence for a little while. Wasn't feeling that hyped. I'm in hype mode now. I can't wait for the movie. I can't wait to see how they're going to wrap up 30 years of Star Wars. More. Yeah, more. 77. <laughs> 1977, 30, 40, 42. 42 years of Star Wars. Anyway, thanks for listening, and we'll talk to you on the next episode.